All right, welcome back to um, another short physics workshop. So you should have already viewed part one of this vectors and forces workshop, which is the basics. Right now I'm about to do problem solving. So you're going to have to get your thinking caps on. Um, I'm assuming a couple things for this. First of all, you're going to have some basic knowledge. So you might have some prerequisites here, or you're going to have to ask for an additional workshop from either myself or Ms. Stevenson. Um, you're going to want to know the basics of trigonometry, okay, and you're probably going to need a calculator. If you haven't really gotten into trig, if you're having some math problems, that's fine. Ms. Stevenson and I can help you. just have to ask. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, for part two of this, uh, we're going to get into some more advanced problem solving. So I've kind of broken down everything you need to be able to do to be successful at this point um, at the kind of end of this unit. Now, I'll be perfectly honest with you, this bottom one down here, actually these bottom two, will be skills that you will be learning over the next couple projects. So um, the head to tail method is a definite that you're gonna to wanna to be able to um, understand clearly. Um, it involves almost no math whatsoever, so that's pretty easy. But then, And then the other two get a little more advanced and there's something that a lot of people struggle with over time. So we're gonna be hitting these on the next several projects. But the earlier you can get these and master them, the better. They're really not that hard once you understand the steps and the logic behind it. So as I go through this, I want you to focus on a couple different things. <clears throat> I want you to focus on the process, which is the math, okay? But I also want you to focus on the logic more than anything else, okay? You need to understand this conceptually and be able to picture it in your head and understand why we're doing it. That's more important than understanding just the steps that you take. All right, so let's go ahead and get started and we'll revert back to this at the end. So first of all, the head to tail method of resolving vectors. <clears throat> so I'm going to say H2T, so head to tail, all right? So this is the head to tail method, and it's really pretty straightforward if you think about it. Um, so if you think about vectors, right, so you've got, uh, let's say you have a person, and there he is, and you have somebody pushes this guy to the right with a force of 5 newtons, and then someone else pushes to the left with a force of five newtons. Your common sense will tell you, well, what is the net force acting on that person? Well, it's, it's zero, right? So this force essentially cancels out that force. But how do you kind of prove that and, and, and use, use vector notation to show that? So if you, you can use the head to tail method. All the head to tail method is, <clears throat> usually in physics when you start dealing with vectors, um, I like to use a little dot to represent whatever my picture is and then draw the forces on there. Um, so there, this is our origin, this is our starting position. If I think of this in terms of a number line, this would be zero, okay? And then I could say this is one, two, three, four, five, and then I could do the same thing over here in the negatives, all right? So um, maybe this is five, this is negative five. We'll take these arrows, these vectors, and put them on a number line, and then you can use the head to tail method. And what I mean by that is, if I take my first one, this first, this positive vector of five newtons, if I draw him on here, and I actually draw the arrow, there's our first vector, okay? It's, it's five newtons long. We'll now take my second vector, which is the one in the opposite direction, and take and put them together head to tail, meaning where this head stops, put the tail of the next vector. So this is my vector right there. So if I just move that down, put the tail where the head stops, and put it on there, it would look like this. And my question is, what is the net change from that zero position? Well, I go five newtons this way, but then five newtons back, and I wind up right back there. And you can see that my net force is zero, okay? Now that might seem a little silly, because you could have just as easily looked at it and said, well, this one's gonna be positive, this one's gonna be negative, so they're gonna cancel out. And that's true, but the head to tail me method is used for more complicated situations as well. For example, let's say you have um, forces acting on an object that aren't necessarily all in one dimension. Meaning, right here, these are all in one dimension, they're in the X dimension, if you think about a um, a graph where you have an X and a Y axis. This is X, those are both an X. Well, what if we had several that are in different dimensions, okay? So maybe you had a 10 Newton force that was pointing that direction. You had a five Newton force that was pointing in that direction. 
you had a, I don't know, two Newton force that was pointing in that direction, and then maybe you had another five Newton force, but this one is pointing in that direction, okay? Well, how could you figure out what your net force is? Well, this is where the head to tail method really gets pretty valuable. So if I take these, and it would, it would work better if you did this kind of on a <clears throat> graph paper or something like that. So here's, here's an XY coordinate system, right? Well, go ahead and put, just doesn't matter what, what order you do this in, it's just like adding anything else. You can add in any order you want. So take your 10 Newton force, and I'm going to go ahead and, and make this one blue. I'm going to make this one green, light green. I'll make the, this one red. And what other colors do I have? I have a darker green. Okay? So just so you can see which ones are which. All right, so now my first one. Starting right here, I draw my vector. And that is 10 newtons long. Okay, so there's my first one. <clears throat> I'm going to write 10 newtons on there too. And then my next one is 5 newtons, and I'm using the head-to-tail method. So I just put the tail of that one at the head of the other. 5 newtons. And then now I have my little 2 newton one that goes down this way. And then I have, finally, another 5 newton one that goes up. And I'm just doing all of these head-to-tail. Okay? Now, that might look confusing, but the nice thing about the head-to-tail method is, well, I put them all in there head-to-tail, now all I have to do is kind of connect from the origin to where my last vector points. So if I do this, I can find my net force sort of graphically by doing this. So that right there, that vector is my net force, okay? And now you may be asking, well, how useful is that? Well, if you think about it, it's pretty stinking useful because you can now, you could measure this. So if you did this on graph paper and maybe you made each, each block one Newton, one square, one Newton, <clears throat> you could physically measure that with a ruler and you could figure out how many Newtons it is. Or the next step is you could use some trigonometry, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this problem in a second. Let's do a slightly simpler one and then we'll come back to this. So let me, I'm gonna show you now how to use some trig to figure out how big your net force is from that. So let's say I have um, two vectors. <clears throat> I have one that is let's say 10 newtons in that direction and then I have another one that is um, let's 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 make it easy 10 newtons in that direction okay <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my head to tail method doesn't matter which order you do them in so that's 10 newtons <clears throat> next one is 10 newtons and then according to what we just did my resultant which is what we call this or the hypotenuse is going to be my net force. I can draw it right there. So I can already indicate the direction of it, but now the question is, what is the magnitude of it? So how, is this is 10, this is 10, well what's that? Okay, now to do this, you're going to have to look at a couple different things. Um, and you're going to have to do some trigonometry. So if you think back to math class, this is a right triangle, okay? So if you think back to our good friend Pythagoras, he came up with a little something called the Pythagorean theorem. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Where for any right triangle, this works for any right triangle, and a, b, and c are right there. So it doesn't matter which one you call a, which one you call b, as long as you call c the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is the longer of the three for a right triangle. Um, so if you do that, so I'm gonna call this a, I'm going to call this B, and this is just my logical thinking I'm modeling. I wouldn't expect you to write all these in your paper or anything like that. Um, I can solve for C using that formula. So if I do some algebra on this, if I want to rearrange this equation to solve for C, the first thing I need to do is get rid of that square root. You get rid of a square root, I mean, I'm sorry, you get rid of that squared. You get rid of a squared by taking the square root, because what is the square root of C squared? Well, it's C. So I do that to both sides, okay? And then what I'm left with is C equals the square root of A squared plus B squared. 
which I can now use that formula right there to solve for my hypotenuse, which is C. So I'm just going to go ahead and re rewrite this with the variables that I have and the actual known values that I have. So A is 10 newtons, so I'm going to put 10 newtons in there, and that's going to be squared, plus B, which is also 10 newtons. And now you can see that all I have to do is math. Okay, so I'm going to do this step by step. I wouldn't expect you to do it step by step, but that's up to you. Um, so I'm going to do what's inside of each of these first. So 10 newtons squared is going to be 100 newtons. But if you think about it, if I take newtons times newtons, I get newtons squared. And that might seem a little annoying, but I'll show you why I do that. Um, and then the same thing over here. 10 squared is 100, and then n squared is n squared. So I can now add these together. So the sum of the forces are whatever the square root of 200 and squared. I just combine like terms. And now I can't really simplify that anymore. So the next step would be to take the square root of that. <clears throat> so I get my calculator. And what I want to do is the square root of 200, which is 14.14. I'm going to call it 14.1 because we're not being that precise with our numbers. Um, so my actual number, 200 squared, is 14.1. Well, what is n squared? n squared is just n, okay? So you might wonder why I did that. Um, a good trick in physics, the more advanced you get, a lot of times you're developing your own equations for things. And if you do things like this with the units, you keep your units with your numbers and you do all the math with your units, you can actually um, predict what you should get for a unit in your answer. For example, if I'm looking for forces, my unit should be newtons. So mathematically, if I do everything right and I get newtons, that means that I'm doing it correctly and I'm gonna get the right answer. So there you go. So my net force, <clears throat> is equal to 14.1 newtons, and I've just solved for that. All right, that's how, that's how you would use the head-to-tail method. Now, <clears throat> going back to our previous problem, we can now revisit this, and you can see that this one is the exact same thing. I did head-to-tail, but it gets a little messy. But if you look carefully at this, you can see that I do have the beginnings of a right triangle right here, okay? The only difference is I have this chunk over here. Well, think about it. This one went down two newtons, and then this one went up three newtons. So what's the difference? How long is this section that's left over? And that should be three newtons, because you got two newtons down and five newtons up. What's actually the sum of those is three newtons up. So you can just transfer that over here if you wanted to. And you can see that's three newtons. And now I have a nice right triangle. So all I do is move this one over there, and it, it gets you the same shape, essentially. Okay? So now I have a right triangle with one side that's 13 newtons long, one side that's five newtons long, and I'm looking for my net force which is the hypotenuse. That's what I'm trying to solve for. And I would do the exact same thing that I just did on the previous page. The net force is going to be equal to, I use Pythagorean theorem, um, 13 newtons squared plus 5 newtons squared. And I would, I would just solve for that. So I'll let you do that on your own mathematically um, to find your net force. Okay. Now, Moving right along, there's one other piece to this that we're kind of leaving off, and some of you may have noticed it if I look at this problem. For my answer right here, I gave a magnitude. Well, what about the direction, okay? If you're going to indicate a force, you should also give a direction. You could show it on a piece of paper and say, well, it's pointing upwards like that, but the better thing to do would be to indicate what that angle is, okay? So that is a Greek letter, theta, theta. T-H-E-T-A. Um, so what is theta? Because if you can do that, you can say it's 14.1 newtons at an angle of blank from the horizon, which is a much more precise way of stating the force. Okay? So I'm going to just kind of transfer this on another piece of paper. So what I have are is my right triangle showing my forces. So 10 newtons, 10 newtons. And some of you may just geometrically be able to predict what that angle is but that's a good thing. But let's go ahead and solve for it and see if your prediction is correct. 
All right, so, and then we had our net force, which was 14.1 newtons. Okay, so what I'm trying to find here is theta. So my question is, how do I do that? And the answer is you use a little bit of trig, okay? So the, oh, you can't see that. The easiest thing to do for trig <clears throat> in physics, especially when you're dealing with vectors, is you're not really getting too complicated, okay? If you can remember your trig function, sorry for the guy mowing the lawn outside the window, Sokatoa, um, which you may have learned from your geometry or your algebra two teacher. If not, it's real simple. <clears throat> this stands for sine equals opposite over hypotenuse. C stands for cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse. And T stands for tangent equals opposite over adjacent. Now you may say, well, I'm, that's really hard to remember. And by the way, I'm writing these kind of down like this. Um, but there's a mnemonic device to help you remember this, okay? And this is the way I learned it when I was in high school. Um, it might not still apply. There might be a better one you can come up with. But what we always used was to, for the S-O-H-C-A-H-T-O-A is some old hippie caught another hippie tripping on acid. That's the way that we always remembered it. And what that means is you look at these three at a time, okay? So S-O-H sine equals opposite over hypotenuse. You can write that as an equation, sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. The next one, if I wanted to, I'll do it down here so you can see a little better, cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse. The equation you can write from that is cosine theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse. And then the last one of the three, tangent equals opposite over adjacent, you can write tangent theta, sorry, that should be an N right there, equals opposite over adjacent. So those are, this is a mnemonic device to help you remember these three equations, okay? Now, when you pick which one you use, it always depends on what your knowns and unknowns are. Sometimes you won't know one of these. So if you don't know the value of the hypotenuse, you don't need to know that in order to figure out what theta is. If you don't know that, as long as you know the other two, you can figure out what theta is. So you just, you pick based on what you know and don't know, all right? In this case, we know all three. So the only thing in any of these equations that's an unknown is the actual value of theta. So it doesn't matter which one I pick. So I can pick whichever one I want. I'm just gonna go ahead and pick the first one. Um, so I'm gonna pick sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse as my equation. And the way you do this is you just plug in what, you, what your, the values are. So sine theta is opposite. So if here's theta, over here is opposite. And adjacent means next to, so that one would be adjacent. And then of course the long one is the hypotenuse. So if I'm looking for opposite, I would go over here, 10 newtons, over hypotenuse, which is 14.1 newtons. <clears throat> now, this is where people usually start getting a little scared because they don't really know what this means, okay? Well, sine is just a function and it causes something to go up and down in a, in a sine wave like this, okay? So it's, it's a variable. The theta is the variable, sine um, is the function that, that you're modeling. So to simplify this though, don't, don't get scared of that. Just go ahead and simplify this, you can do that. This is 10 newtons divided by 14.1 newtons. So let's go ahead and figure out what that is. 10 divided by 14.1 is 0 0.7 newtons, okay? And then, so now I've simplified my equation a little bit, sine theta equals 0 0.7 newtons. Um, I'm not done though, because what I want is theta, not sine theta. So what I always tell people to do is treat this like you would treat any other math problem, right? So if, you, if, ec, if theta was, was represented by x, for example, and there was a number in front of it, well, how would you get rid of that number? You would divide by it. Well, let's just go ahead and do that. So if I divide by sine, it cancels but that means I have to do the same thing to both sides, okay? And now I have theta equals 0 0.7 newtons over sine. Well, mathematically, dividing by something is exactly the same as multiplying by its inverse. Right? 
And the nice thing about that is on your calculator, <clears throat> this right here is actually on your calculator. There's a button for that. All right? It doesn't look like that because another way to write 1 over sine is sine to the negative 1. That's another way to write that. So this is the button we're looking for in our calculator, and then we can actually just solve this problem. So what I'm looking for is one or sine to the negative 1. Okay, it's right there. So I hit second, sine negative 1. Um, actually, let me do one thing. Change to degrees. When in physics, you're doing degrees. In math, you might be doing something else. Okay, um, so second, negative 1 of 0.7, close my parentheses, and I get 44.42 degrees. Okay, which some of you may have predicted since these sides are equal, this should be a 45 degree angle, and you can see we're pretty stinking close to 45 degrees, so you were right, okay? So now, my net force, which I was solving for in the previous problem, is going to be 14.1 Newtons at an angle of 44.4 degrees, measured from the horizontal, all right? That is pretty much as hard as it gets, okay, when you're using the head-to-tail method. You put them together, and then you solve for the value. All right, so there's only one sort of skill left in this, uh, in, in doing force vectors, and that's doing the opposite. So what we just did was we put forces together to find a hypotenuse. So the next challenge is going to be, well, what if we give you the hypotenuse? How do you break that apart into its components? So I'm going to let you stew on that a little bit, and I'm going to address it in a third video. Thanks.